Our next guest is the co-founder of women's health app Clue, uh, uh, which has over 2.5 million users from 180 different countries. She believes that by turning to technology and generating data, we can learn more about ourselves and our bodies and improve our health and well-being as a result. Please welcome Ida Tin with Fortune's Maithri Sitaraman. Thank you. So you know technology moves really quick when um, Ida backstage says, actually, the numbers have changed. So Ida, tell us, um, Clue, subscribers, how many now? Well over 10 million active users. There we go. We, are, we stand corrected. And like I said, technology moves really fast. Yesterday, I, I don't know whether you noticed, but at the big get to know, Edith uh, introduced herself as the mother of femtech, the term. Um, I think that's quite apt considering what Clue does. Um, $30 million raised. Mm -hmm. Now a new monetization strategy in place. Uh, 10 million users. Every founder has a reason for starting a business, wanting to, to succeed. What's the clue story for you? Mm. Yeah, it's true. It really started as a kind of a question in my mind. I was like, how can it be that there has been really no innovation um, within family planning since the pill came out 70 years ago? I mean, in the history of technology, that's a very, very long time. And I felt that maybe we could do something that was data base rather than chemistry base. So it really started from my, my own kind of, I want something else. I want to have more choice of um, family planning methods. Um, and then also just a curiosity of like, what is this system doing? Um, <laughs> you know, I wanted to be able to kind of navigate my life, both in the big life decisions of family, but also just kind of why do I feel like this today when I felt different yesterday? Is, is, is some of this down to people wanting or you wanting to understand your own body or the medical profession not listening enough to what you were saying? Well, we definitely hear all the time that women come and they say, I went to my doctor and I described what was going on and then the doctor said, yeah, it hurts to be a woman. And we're like, what? <laughs> so there is definitely an acute lack of awareness um, in the healthcare system to really, really listen to women. But there is also, I think, a huge opportunity to, for women to actually listen to themselves and actually be knowledgeable and embodied enough to take their bodies seriously. When you look at all the data and you talked about, I mean, this is a lot of data that they're collecting. And I, I'm going to come back to the question of what are you going to do with that data and how are you going to protect? a lot of the people who are trusting you with that data. But we'll come back to that question. I think the idea of these women entering the data, what's the strangest bits of data that you now have under your belt? It's got to be quite strange. <laughs> it's intimate. You know, people, they share data about the most intimate part of their lives. They talk about their mood. They talk about their pain. They talk about their sex lives. And in my, you know, in my perspective, nothing is really weird. It all makes sense. <laughs> it might be that we can't quite connect the dots yet. And I think that's our task as a technology firm is to help people understand, you know, what, what does it really mean, all these things that we experience? Um, and also using AI to help, you know, really understand things that, that where you need the big global data set to understand what's going on. You told me uh, a, a little while ago that you collected a bit of data in 2016 that related to people's moods. Tell That's us a little true. bit more about that because it really does explain how much data you're, you're getting under your, onto yeah, your systems. So, so what we saw on the day of the American presidential election was that a lot of people tracked their mood and there was a lot of sadness. We could, we could see you know, we could see a real spike that people felt sad. And, um, you know, maybe that says something about our user demographic, but it is interesting to see that, you know, what happens in society really has an effect, and the effect is also a body effect. And I think getting those things connected is quite interesting as a society. You know, how can we bring the knowledge about our bodies 
back into everything we do. So how has uh, Clue grown? Because it started off in, in Berlin, uh, which is quite a hub in Europe for technology. Uh, Amsterdam's another one, London's another one. But w how much has it grown and where are your users located? Um, and how is th the interaction with Clue different when it comes to different geographies that you're in? Yeah, so we started out um, in Berlin, but we had this really strong ambition to be a global company from the get-go. So we actually launched in San Francisco, and our user base is um, primarily in the US, but also around the whole world. Um, so in that sense, it hasn't changed, and I have a, an ambition as a founder to see if I can get all the greatest tech talent in the world to come to me in Berlin. <laughs> so we, you know, we've managed to get I think really, really stunning talent from all over the world to actually move to Berlin because I think part of our culture at Clue is to be kind of close um, and having that kind of high intelligence human touch with each other. Um, so as long as I can make people move to Berlin, I'm going to do that <laughs> before opening offices anywhere else. It's a fantastic city. I can sell it as much as you sell Montreal. But uh, tell me a little bit more about the, the way that Clue has really grown, because what sets you apart is the idea of sustainability. You're not building a company for sale like a lot of founders want to. Um, you're talking about, I mean, uh, very recently you talked about your data usage and compared yourself to Facebook and Cambridge Analytica, which I know we'll talk about a little bit later today. Um, how is the company growing and how are you interacting with your customers and gaining their trust, no matter where they live in the world now? Yeah, I think trust, I mean, trust is an absolute key concept for us. If you ask people to share this data, you've got to <clears throat> have some kind of ethical conversations about what you're going to do with that data with yourself. And, um, you know, We've heard this many times on stage. It all starts with the user need. I mean, I started this company because I wanted to see if I could support women in their lives. And what I want to build is a companion for women um, so that somebody can take them by their hand and walk through their lives and help them understand their bodies. And you know, that's what's driving me. So I'd love to be able to do this work still in many years. Um, one of the things, one of the big pieces that have come together this year for us is that we have um, a senior management team in place. And as a founder, that's like a sensitive piece, like, you know, giving away part of your baby. <laughs> but I really, um, I really do appreciate being able to rest into this competence that we now have on the team. Um, but of course, that also, you know, it's, you're attracting talent from pretty much across the world at very high levels, and that yeah. says something about the trajectory. How are you communicating your data usage with customers in, yeah. in the monetization policy now? Yeah, so I have written quite a few things where I really try to explain where we're coming from, who are we, how do we think about this, what are our principles for monetization, what's our principle for using data. We have written a terms of service that people can actually read and understand. It's not small print. We want them to read it. You know, I believe that as a principle in the app economy, your user should be able to understand how you make money. There are so many companies that build their business model on the premise that their users don't understand the business model. Because if they knew, they actually wouldn't want to use the product. So for me, that's a big part of building trust is to, you know, enable people to actually understand what's going on. Does anyone have a question for Ida? Because she, she has such a fascinating story of where she came from and where she's headed. But it's, it kind of resonates with a lot of uh, folks who are trying to do business here in Canada. So anyone for, with any questions? Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, if you can wait for the mic, that'll be oh. fantastic. Hi, Dale Haddon from Women When. Um, oh, do I have to stand? Okay. I'd love to know if you could walk us through how it works, from the example of the problem, and then how you, you know, log into Clue, and then how you solve it. Just how it actually functions. Yeah. So, 
You open the app on your phone, you download it in any app store, Android or iOS, and then you can see this uh, visual representation of your cycle, and you enter data. You can say, today my bleed is starting, or my mood is this and this, and then you can also connect to ver um, various variables. You can connect to your watch, you can connect to a really fantastic Finnish product called Ura Ring that measures a bunch of things, um, Fitbit. And then we process all that data so we can give you a forecast. So we can tell you in the next couple of days, this is what you can expect. We can also give you a forecast for when your next period is coming. And we can do a doctor report for you so that you can bring all this data to your doctor so that the doctor has a much you know, better starting point for giving you service. Um, and then there is a lot of educational content in the app and on our website because what we find is that you've got to provide context for the data. It's not enough to tell you, oh, you know, your average cycle is 40 days. Well, what does that mean? So there is a lot of um, teach, like education is actually a huge part of what we do. And you would be surprised. I mean, now I've been in this space for 10 years and female health just keeps expanding for me. It is so central to our mental health, our chronic diseases, our sexuality, our identity, you know, our performance. So I think people more and more, as they start tracking more, the body awareness level go up and they start saying, oh, actually this is affecting which days I should do sport or what my sex drive is like throughout the cycle or as I go through life, how am I changing? Seeing so that another question. Um, switching gears a little bit, uh, I was interested to hear, I think you said that you'd raised 30 million in financing and something that we hear a lot is the difficulties that women especially have in terms of attracting capital. Um, can you walk us through a little bit, you know, how, where did your sources of capital come from? How did you pitch it? Um, mm. you, know, you know, a little bit of the business model, the, the business model that attracted the capital to you. Mm. So we started out raising money from angels. We raised 70,000 euros from five angels, so we were basically out of money from day one. <laughs> um, and went on to raise more angel capital and then eventually raised our series A and B from institutional investors um, in the US and UK. Um, and so raising money is like a whole art form, but if I were to do, say really, really shortly, if you think it's a business conversation, think again, it's a, it's a social game more than anything. And um, part of that game is definitely know how to um, operate in a man's world, because it is. And part of a strategy for doing that might be to have a male by your side. <laughs> Um, and that worked for you. You had you had co-founders who were men. My partner is um, my one of my co-founders, so we've raised money together. And um, and then I think there's also something about bridging into the men's world. So when I've been pitching to investors, I really, I really, from a very honest place, try to include them in my world. So I talk about places where we can meet. We talk about data. We talk about, um, we have this really funny graph in the, in the pitch deck where we show women's four primary sex hormones and how they go up and down through a cycle. And then we show men's sex hormones. There are two and they're like two flat lines. <laughs> and you know, it just kind of brings it back for the men like, oh, there is something different going on here, you know? <laughs> so, we, so really trying to, to help them into understanding this world that even most women barely understand. I mean, I'm definitely still learning. So, but I think the really big op business opportunity that they saw and that they see is that, you know, we have tech tools to navigate, finding our way, finding our friends, finding things to buy, but what are the di digital tools to make us understand our bodies? Still a huge black box. And if, if we can build a trusted relationship with users where they think, oh, I'll go to Clue to figure out what's going on. Which day should I do sport? How does this birth control affect my life? All these many questions that we all have through this long journey, that's a huge business opportunity. And it's, I, it's a huge industry as well that's um, got growth potential par none at this point. Yeah, just if I can add one sentence yep. to that. So, the reason why I coined the term femtech was because I saw so much activity in this space. I saw these primarily women starting businesses, creating services, products to support women in the parts of their lives that are unique because they, we have this biology. And I looked across and I was like, we, we need to 
start to think of this as one business category. And by doing that, I think it's easier to, for the male investors to say, yeah, I have a femtech company in my portfolio versus, yeah, I invest in this company helping women not to pee in their pants. Or, you know, it's like, it just creates like, you know, it, it's helpful, I feel. It's helpful indeed. Ida, thank you very much. And hopefully we don't do that. Thank you, thank you very much.